Hi everyone. So the purpose of this class is to um, begin closing the first few classes that we had on uh, Marxism and semiotics and uh, also throw a bridge, a link uh, these concepts to the notion of psychoanalysis. That's what the spectacle of the other stands for because there are different ways of approaching the notion of the other. So as we've seen in Marx, uh, the other with a big O is in a certain sense the commodity or if you want capital from which the worker is alienated and dominated. Uh, for Guy Debord and uh, Jean Baudrillard, if you want, the other is the spectacle from which uh, life itself is uh, separated and removed, cut off, um, if you want, alienated. And for Roland Barthes, uh, the other is myth, right? The second order semiological system which deprives signs and individuals of their particular history. So we can say that overall in uh, Marxist terms, the other is uh, capital with the capital C, which dominates and reduces the complexity of human beings. Um, when we shift to semiotics, we have seen how for the founder of uh, modern uh, linguistics and modern structuralism, Ferdinand de Saussure, language as opposed to speech is other. Uh, language is always the discourse uh, of the other, in that the individual cannot control the rules of language and its evolution over time. At the same time, for Saussure, meaning is not determined by the inherent properties of a sign, but by the difference among signs, the play of difference within a certain linguistic structure. Such difference is often determined through binary oppositions, such as white and black, male and female, native immigrant, and in our culture, I mark this in bold because these are obviously, uh, these terms are not equivalent. There is one term of the two that is considered to be uh, dominant. And uh, the other can be seen as a foundational split in signification, in that there is no meaning, no production of meaning without the other, at least in structuralist uh, terms. So, for example, if we look at this ad that was um, in the Stuart Toll uh, text on the spectacle of the other, um, this is a famous ad, a Pirelli ad from the 1980s, I believe, which features a famous uh, athlete, um, a US uh, champion, uh, Carl Lewis, uh, and it says, power is nothing without control. So my question for you is to think how, by using this semiotic approach, this ad mobilizes binary oppositions. Um, the third approach to the other is a psychoanalytic uh, one, which is the one that we are uh, beginning to study now. Now, for Freud, the founder of modern psychoanalysis, the other is essential to the constitution of sexual identity and the subject. Uh, as you know, a key concept uh, for Freud is the notion of the Oedipus complex. Uh, for uh, Freud, the boy initially desires sexually his mother, but his desire cannot be uh, realized is foreclosed because of the presence of the father. Therefore, the boy identifies with his father when he realizes that his mother, according to Freud, was punished by castration. By contrast, the girl, within the Oedipus complex, initially identifies with the father, but when she realizes that she cannot uh, be him, she unconsciously tries to win him over by bearing his child, and hence she becomes mother. Um, this is, uh, has been uh, uh, criticized uh, by many women and feminists, but uh, the, w the, the reason why I'm referring here to the uh, Oedipus complex is that, as you can see, the um, uh, gender identity is fundamentally structured through this relation with the opposite uh, sex. Um, uh, Jacques Lacan, who is a very important, uh, perhaps the most important psychoanalyst of the second half of the 20th century, uh, added to uh, the Freudian Oedipus complex the notion of the mirror stage. Uh, Lacan argues that toddlers acquire a sense of self after they recognize themselves 
in the mirror. Uh, until that point, uh, a toddler is not fully aware of being one. Is doesn't have or she doesn't have a full control of her limbs. His body is kind of scattered. But at the moment in which he realizes to be the subject who reflects himself uh, in the mirror, he acquires the sense of the uh, imaginary wholeness onto which um, it's um, otherwise a fragmentary experience of the real uh, as um, cannot properly uh, be um, experienced. Now, um, identification through the mirror stage for Lacan is fundamentally narcissistic and therefore is partial and incomplete because ultimately you identify yourself with what? With an image in a mirror that is by definition something that is unstable and uh, fleeting. So, um, because narcissistic identification is incomplete, Lacan argues that it needs to be filled in through imagination. This imagination for him is a fantasy construction, a self-gratifying mechanism through which the individual sees himself as perfect. And the ideal ego continues to accompany us throughout our lives, setting in motion this desire to return to this stage of original perfection, in uh, uh, reflect perfection as reflection uh, in the mirror. So for Lacan, desire uh, points to this fundamental lack in the structure of the subject that we try to appease this sense of lack through temporary gratifications such as consumerism, careerism, sexual satisfactions. How many times did you um, get that sense that you were very excited about, say, a product or something like a phone that you eventually managed to get and um, that sense of excitement, as we know, vanishes after a few days or weeks and uh, uh, it gives way to desire for something else. So desire is always desire for desiring um, uh, other things. Um, so the imaginary ego the imaginary, uh, the ideal ego, uh, or the notion of the imaginary, is uh, circulated through the media in a variety of forms. We might think about uh, girl bands um, uh, like uh, Spice Girls or uh, boy bands like One Directions as these moments in which teenagers can identify with uh, those subjects that um, um, they could, uh, you know, be themselves, right? So these bands are engineered by the cultural industry to allow you uh, to have a screen in which, in a certain sense, you can see yourself as perfect in the mirror. Uh, by contrast, uh, the, um, uh, for Lacan, the ego ideal, so the imaginary is the ideal ego, but the ego ideal, the notion of the ego ideal, pertains to how the subject sees himself from an ideal point of view, the big other that is external to himself. Therefore, not a mirror image, not a narcissistic reflection, but a point of view, the gates of the other. Symbolic identifications pertains to how this big other sees us, propelling us to give our best, um, challenging us, um, the symbolic order, which is uh, structured by these gates of the other, coincides thus with Lacan, for Lacan with the law, the master signifier, the what he calls the name of the father, uh, that is the set of restrictions that both control our desire and regulate communication within our society. So, for example, um, the way your teacher um, in any field judges your work is the point of view if you want, of the law, the master signifier that um, uh, challenges you. So my questions are um, simple and complex, if you want, uh, because on one end, I'm, I'm asking you to use these concepts, these Lacanian concepts, and apply them to media analysis. How does symbolic identification, the notion of ego ideal, circulates through the media? Do the media tend to appeal only to our imagination, as we've seen with the example of uh, boy bands and girl bands, and gratified for our fantasies, or do, uh, do they also challenge us? So I'm asking you here to make examples in a, in a comment. If you want, you can embed uh, media, as usual, from um, other websites of how 
media shape uh, your sense of self uh, or who you are in both senses, the imaginary and the identification, like the, the symbolic identification. And this will be useful, this exercise, also for your media autobiography. Looking forward to reading your comments.